All right. Um, so we'll start talking about the kind of highlights at the end of 2018. And if you really look back at what happened this year, RISC-V has grown tremendously. Um, the number of companies who are working on RISC-V projects, the number of people in the RISC-V Foundation, uh, the number of things that we see going on. Uh, RISC-V really is a, a global uh, phenomenon. Uh, I just came back from, from two weeks in China. Uh, I've been traveling a lot. Uh, and there's RISC-V activity going on all throughout the world. Uh, so if you look at sci five now from you know, startup company a few years ago as RISC-V was just getting started, you know, we now have offices uh, in, in over 10 different cities all around the world uh, to reflect the growing demand uh, for RISC-V. Um, the amount of products that we're building um, in terms of CPU, IP, the product portfolio uh, that we have in terms of RISC-V products, uh, really today we already cover about 75 to 80% of ARM's Cortex roadmap. And RISC-V, we're just getting started. All right, so one of the things that we talk about is we really believe that RISC-V means that every customer, every project, every chip is going to have its own custom RISC-V core. As everybody, everything's different, so every core should be different. Um, so the speed at which RISC-V products are being built, I think is also unprecedented. So we have a very large product portfolio. Um, and now this year, we're also starting to see customer success. All right, so all the RISC-V activity that's been going on in the past couple of years, uh, we're now starting to see RISC-V silicon in commercial products. Uh, we're starting to see people announcing their products with RISC-V in it. Uh, it's gone past the point where everybody thinks that everybody's working on something to where there's actually very concrete products. And I think we see that uh, on the show floor, uh, on the booth, we'll see actually RISC-V products there. We see that in some of the keynote uh, announcements this morning. Uh, I'll show you some examples of that uh, today as well. So globally, um, you know, what's driving this? And we, Folks talked about this morning. This is like the global trend. You know, by 2022, 60% uh, of the world will be connected uh, to the internet, um, up from 45%. Uh, if you compare it to North America, North America is already actually at 94%. Uh, so we have a significant way to go. But while the global side catches up on that, uh, you know, the number of devices that they'll have that's connected uh, to the internet, 3.6 in North America is almost 14. There's a tremendous amount of new applications that are going to be coming and new opportunities for, for products. So this is leading to what we call embedded intelligence, specifically embedded intelligence everywhere. So what I see is like a lot of the traditional areas where embedded applications took place, uh, because these things touch the real world. So you look at a storage controller, it touches memory. You look at something on the edge, like sensor data, that's things that touch the real world, that touch the analog world. These are all traditionally have been embedded products, embedded applications. Uh, but because of the, the number of increase in data and the usefulness of this, all these embedded products now need to be intelligent. So we're in a real world where we have more embedded devices and all the embedded devices need to be intelligent. Right? So of course, uh, all these things, there's, there's, there's uh, table stakes that come in. You have to have make sure these things are secure. You have to make sure things are, uh, work well. But fundamentally, we're taking embedded applications and we need to create more compute and the ability to compute data there. Uh, so one of the areas that we see here, for example, in storage, networking, 5G, just tremendous growth, tremendous opportunity for RISC-V type applications here, uh, bringing intelligence there. Uh, on the machine learning and edge, these are like sensor hubs, these are gateways, uh, processing all of that data, you want to bring that data, uh, the processing near the data. So this also means that all of these processing is what I call domain-specific architectures. There's lots of room for customization, um, different types of compute needs to happen, and this all leads into very positive markets for RISC-V, uh, because RISC-V is to go into these new markets uh, where there are not well-established software stacks, where new things are being developed, and customization really matters. So uh, we recently announced the Core IP7 series at sci 5 um, This is the highest performing uh, commercial RISC-V processor IP, and it's really designed for those embedded intelligent, uh, embedded intelligent applications uh, we described. So at Sci-Fi, when we announced this, there was actually three uh, different series. Uh, so Sci-Fi cores are built by series. Um, so the E7, the S7, and the U7. Um, so anything that starts with a U from Sci-Fi, uh, those are cores that you use for uh, Linux-type applications. So the U cores have virtual memory support, supervisor mode, TLBs, things of that nature. Whereas the E and the S series are more for embedded applications, kind of running RTOSes uh, or bare metal. Uh, the E series is 32-bit, the S series is 64-bit. Um, so this way, uh, within one series, they actually have very common feature sets, which we'll talk about, uh, but they can apply to all the different markets that I, that I described earlier. 
Um, and then if you compare this to our previous generation, why does the highest performing core, uh, we see 60% increase in core mark per megahertz, 40% increase in DMIS per megahertz, 10% increase in, in FMAX. Um, so these are very high performance cores now uh, that can be used uh, in these applications. So let me tell you more details about this. So within the seven series, within each series, we have a very large customization space uh, where customers can come in um, and can customize the core specifically for their applications. So things inside the microarchitecture, uh, the type of memory subsystem, um, the size of your branch predictor tables, interrupts, a lot of microarchitecture features are all customizable. Uh, but because it's all customizable, uh, it also makes it very hard for us to tell you, well, what's the performance uh, of, of an of a E7, for example? Um, so for that reason, uh, we also have what we call the standard cores. So standard cores are pre-configured implementations uh, within the core series. So when we announced the 7 series uh, last month, we actually announced with it six different standard cores. So if you go back and you think about how fast is RISC-V being developed, well, we launched six cores uh, in one day, uh, plus a bunch of other series. So we have the E76, which is a single core 32-bit uh, embedded. We have the E76MC, which is a multi-core uh, version of that. The S76 is the 64-bit, and of course the U76 uh, supports uh, virtual memory uh, and, and Linux type applications. So what's really cool about the 7 series is that you can actually combine these cores in a single heterogeneous uh, multi-core system. So if you see this diagram here, I actually have multiple U7 cores and an S7 core in a single coherent subsystem. So this is what we call in-cluster coherent uh, compute. Um, so why is this important? Because we just go back to the, the markets I talked about, the embedded intelligence markets. These are embedded applications. So you still need cores that are very deterministic with real-time capabilities to talk to your embedded applications, your traditional SSD controller, for example, processing sensor data on real-time deterministic basis. But at the same time, because you're running more complex software stacks in different applications, you want to be able to run these application-type cores. So that's where the U core stands in. You can run Linux and you can run advanced um, applications, take advantage of software libraries that have been written for higher level computes. But because this is all in one single coherent subsystem, uh, that makes it very easy for the data to be shared and software to be written. All right. So in addition here, if we look at some of the other seven series features, we also talk about enhanced determinism for hard real time constraints. Uh, so these are features like uh, locking down the memories, uh, configuring the branch predictor so that uh, it's very deterministic. Um, there's a lot of built-in features here um, that don't exist in, in other uh, architectures that allow for very, very deterministic cores. And then you can apply this both to the quote-unquote traditional real-time cores, but also the application cores as well. So even in your U cores, uh, you can do certain of these features uh, that enhance the determinism. Um, and then, uh, of course, it's very extensible. So you go back to RISC-V and the ability to add in uh, custom instructions. Um, so you, this is something that you, you can add in different instructions uh, into the different cores. Um, and because it's heterogeneous, you don't have to add it to all the cores. You can add it to cores that you need to do whatever embedded applications, but maybe not the other ones. Uh, so this is a very, very flexible um, type of system. And why this is so important is if we go back to the journey of, of RISC-V, uh, I view this as something where now RISC-V and these, these products is offering something in the market that no other uh, architecture offers, right? So RISC-V is not just, it's a lower cost replacement or different business model replacing different architectures, but now we can actually bring in features that are needed for these new markets much faster that don't exist anywhere else. All right. So this is kind of a more detailed block diagram of a system architecture taking advantage of the heterogeneous use cases. So in this example, the two cores on the left, there's an A core and a B core. These are both S7 cores, so these are 64-bit uh, embedded cores. Um, and then you have a multi-core system on the right, the U7 core. All four of these cores are coherent uh, in one single subsystem. So what can you do with something like this? Well, what you can do is like you can take your two U7 cores and you can run multi-core Linux. It just looks like Linux. You can run your embedded applications using your S7 core. So let's say this is like a storage controller or something. So the S7s, they can be controlling uh, your, your FTL or other translation layers. So in the S7 cores, you see um, that it has uh, uh, an item, so it has a tightly integrated memory on the instruction side, 
as a fast I.O. port with local SRAM uh, in red. So these are very deterministic, fast access to local memory. But at the same time, because the whole system is coherent, your A core can read the memory in your B core, and your Linux core can also read the memories uh, in the S cores as well. Simultaneously, all of these can come out of the core complex. You can go into your L2, you can go into your memory subsystem, you can go into your DRAM, or you can go into more uh, either shared uh, uh, cacheable RAM or non-cacheable SRAM. So this is a very, very flexible type subsystem for these type of advanced applications. And what we do at, at Sci-5 is we deliver this as a single deliverable. So very, very complex core configurations, whether it's four cores or eight cores or nine cores or six cores, all of them different. Uh, everything here uh, in this gray box becomes a single deliverable uh, from Sci-5. So it's very easy to use and configure uh, inside the customer system. All right, so I mentioned earlier what we believe about RISC-V is it's all about configurability. It's all about letting each project, each customer have its own core, uh, different use cases. So uh, customers come to us. They can work with us to configure this specifically for their system. They get a single deliverable that it's very fast to use uh, in their application. All right. Um, so 2018, I also mentioned, was kind of the commercial success. So it's just some of the customers who've taken advantage of RISC V uh, this year. Um, so Fadu, they actually have a talk tomorrow uh, about their SSD uh, controller. This is the world's first uh, RISC V SSD controller. Uh, they use the Sci-5 E51, which is a 64-bit uh, embedded core. Um, they got one-third the power and one-third the area. Um, how do you do that? Well, you customize it. So they went in, they looked at the core, they took out what they didn't need, they tweaked it uh, specifically for their applications. Right, so RISC V is really enabling uh, better performance, better power, new applications. Right? This is an example of something that's an embedded intelligent device having a better core. Um, this morning, uh, Microsoft Media announced uh, the Profire SOC FPGA architecture, uh, which brings real-time to Linux. So this is a lot about the real-time application, real-time features uh, that I've been talking about. Um, so this is something that was announced this morning uh, in the keynote. Uh, it's kind of very exciting. Um, there's a lot of secure features built into this um, that I'll leave for, for the other talks. Um, this is like an example of an intelligent edge device. All right, then you go all the way to uh, wearable AI. So those of you who don't know uh, Huami, uh, Huami is, uh, uh, they make smart watches and fitness band trackers primarily in, in China. Uh, they actually ship tremendous volumes uh, of these devices. Uh, if you've never heard of them. So recently they announced their, their chip called the Huangsang Number no. 1. Uh, they call this the world's first artificial intelligence powered wearable chipset. Uh, this is powered by an a e E31 uh, RISC V core. Uh, using that, it's 38% more power efficient than, than what they would have had. Right? Now what does that mean? So that means they can take this and then they have uh, biometric and AI capabilities. So some of these applications, kind of the hard ID ECG, these are things that have typically only been found in very high-end, uh, very expensive uh, smartwatches and fitness trackers. Um, but by doing this, they can drive the cost down and bring these features now uh, into much lower cost devices. All right, so we talked about kind of the global trends of more connected devices, more intelligent things in these devices, but we also have to make them uh, more affordable. A lot of that comes from uh, integration and better product features. So more customizations means lower power, lower cost. So we really believe that you know, with RISC-V, we can enable a world of a trillion connected devices, um, embedding intelligence everywhere. Um, you need efficient performance. You need scalability, uh, which is why the customization matters, which is why you need 32-bit cores, 64-bit cores, Linux cores. You need the ability to combine uh, all of these things together. Um, you need features like determinism. You need features like uh, heterogeneous compute. Um, so all of these things put together uh, in a broad portfolio is going to be very important for the adoption uh, of RISC-V in, in these variety of applications. Um, so I think uh, what we're seeing this year is, is the fruits of a lot of this work that's been done over the past uh, couple of years. Um, I really look forward to, to kind of next year because uh, the amount of projects that we know that's happening, uh, I think next year we're going to see even more uh, project announcements. I think this room will be uh, twice or three times the size uh, next year. Um, and I can't wait to see uh, what else we can all do together. So thank you.